Welcome back. I hope you had an enjoyable break and discussion time. I know that with a topic this mind-bending that uh, a break probably serves us well just to try to let these thoughts crystallize because whenever we contemplate God it is a stretching experience. Uh, as we ended the last hour we were looking at the holiness of God. Remember we're looking at three moral attributes of God, holiness, righteousness, goodness, and under goodness we have five aspects, five components. So now we move into the second of the moral attributes of God, God's righteousness or justice. Uh, literally it, the idea is conformity to a law or conformity to a standard. Uh, in John 17.25, just as I mentioned from John 17.11, when Jesus prayed to the Father, He said, O Holy Father, called him holy. In John 17, 25, he called him righteous father. <clears throat> so that is also instructive to us and one of the key verses on the righteousness of God. So let's develop this attribute just as we have the others. Uh, it's basic relationships uh, to other words, righteousness, righteous, right, justification, justice, and just all come from the same Greek root word root. So it's obvious that all of these words are interrelated and closely related. The relationship of God's righteousness to His holiness, you could describe it this way. Righteousness conforms to holiness. That is, righteousness fulfills what holiness demands. And then if you want to compare righteousness to truthfulness, uh, this truthfulness is an aspect of righteousness. So we're just trying to look at sort of all the angles to zero in on what we mean by God being righteous. Uh, you could look at it this way. There are two aspects. First of all, there is absolute righteousness. That is, God is infinitely righteous in Himself. He is righteous. If He had never created this universe, if He had never created the spirit world, if He had never created human beings, or never had interacted with what he created, God would still be righteous. That's what he is. He is infinitely righteous in himself. But then the second bullet point, uh, you can talk about God's relative righteousness, that is the way he relates to mankind, relate the way he relates to his creatures. God's future judgment will be perfectly just and exact because he is righteous. That's what it will be. And this involves remunerative justice, or reward, uh, and this also involves retribu uh, retributive, retributive justice or punishment, however you say that word. Uh, so this involves reward and punishment. So first of all, uh, remunerative justice, this is the distribution of rewards for, for obedience and faithful service. In Hebrews 6.10, the author of Hebrews says, God is not unrighteous. So as to forget your work and the you know your the labor of love that you've shown toward His name, that's a sort of a Hebrew way of saying or a Jewish way of saying God is righteous. So when he says the writer says God is not unrighteous, it's sort of coming at it from the back door, or saying it in a different way. God is righteous. He doesn't forget what we have done by way of service and sacrifice. And of course, the clear implication of that is God is not unrighteous. God will not forget. He will remember. He will reward. And in 2 Timothy 4.8, Paul looked forward to this. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the end of his life, he said, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Uh, finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So Paul there affirms that he looked forward to the fact that God would reward him, the Lord, the righteous judge, uh, because God is righteous. However, you could say this, second bullet point there, in one sense these rewards are not deserved because they are from His grace and obtained through His power. And I believe that is the point of the picture in Revelation 4 where you have these 24 elders around the throne with crowns on their heads and as they worship they cast their crowns before the Lamb, before God and before the Lamb. And I think it's a way of saying any rewards we receive, we recognize it's all by your grace 
through your power. So uh, it's not our own doing. And yet, and yet, the New Testament is very clear that at some point in the future, the Lord is going to reward, reward his faithful servants. And one of the reasons why he will do that is because he is righteous. And, uh, he, and it is right for him to remember and not forget. Uh, secondly, retributive justice. Uh, this is the infliction of punishment for violation of divine law. Second Thessalonians 1.8 talks about the return of Christ. He's coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is totally, fully deserved. In fact, I used to have a theology professor who said everything outside of the lake of fire is grace. And he didn't mean by that statement just something in the future. Right now, everything outside of the lake of fire is grace. We all deserve to be there right now. It's just unfathomable that we're not there. And so in the future, when God meets out his justice, uh, his retributive justice, it will be fully and totally deserved. It is because God is righteous. So what points of application for our own lives can we draw from this? First of all, whatever God does is right, whether we can understand it or not. And I would encourage you wholeheartedly to get that truth just riveted in your heart, uh, because if you haven't already gone through some horrendously difficult things in life, you will at some point. And if you don't have fixed in your heart a, an assurance that God is righteous, he doesn't make mistakes, he cannot make mistakes, whatever he does is right. If you don't have that truth fixed in your heart, you're going to find yourself wavering when adversity hits. So get that truth in your heart. Secondly, a second point of application, God must punish sinners. Holiness has been offended, righteous demands Righteousness demands punishment. God must punish unrepentant sinners. And then thirdly, we can reinforce this truth in our minds by addressing God as righteous Father. And we're right back to where we started on this point, John 17, 25. And I think it's very interesting to note that on the night before Jesus knew he was going to experience the wrath of God, he said, O oh, righteous Father. It was almost as if he was reminding himself, God is righteous. Everything he does is right, whether we can understand it or not. He doesn't make mistakes. He cannot make mistakes. He is righteous. So I would encourage you sometimes, and again, not all the time, because you don't want to just become a, you know, something you just go through the motions and do or say, but, but on occasion or on several occasions, on a regular occasion, in your prayers, to address God as righteous Father, because indeed He is righteous. That leads us to the third moral attribute that we want to consider this evening, and that is the goodness of God. Uh, a, a brief definition, God bears all the qualities of an ideal person. And remember, God is a person. He's not a human being, but He is a person. Intellect, emotions, and will he has personality, that is not personality like someone's outgoing, or he has all the components of personhood, and he, he bears all the qualities of an ideal person. You remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus in Mark 10 and called him good teacher, or good master, and Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only one is good, and that is God. And of course, Jesus wasn't denying that he was good. He was basically saying, do you realize that by calling me good, you're calling me God? Because only one is really good, that's God. And it's almost as if Jesus was saying, well, to start this conversation about eternal life, we need to start on the right foot, and that is with you understanding I am God. When you call me good, you're calling me God, and that is right. But do you understand that? And I'm not sure the rich young ruler did. But anyway, Mark 10, 18, God is good. As I've mentioned, under the goodness of God, we're going to delineate five components, various aspects, God's love, God's benevolence or kindness, God's mercy, God's grace, and then the, the fifth one, long-suffering, forbearance, patience. Uh, all of those are 
basically synonyms describing the same thing. So let's look at each one. First of all, love. First John 4, 8, that remarkable statement, God is love. Don't let your familiarity with that statement rob you of the astounding nature of that statement. I, I only know three or four places in the Bible where you have that kind of statement. God is love. God is light. God is a consuming fire. There aren't many of those kinds of statements, but one of them is 1 John 4, 8, God is love. This is both emotional, as in John 5.20 and Revelation 3.19, and the reason I call that emotional is because the Greek word used in those two verses is not the word that we're most familiar with, agape or agapao, it's the word phileo, John 5.20, the Father loves the Son, uh, not just with volitional, willful love, God loves the Son emotionally. In Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I chasten. God not only loves us with a, a volitional love or love of the will, He loves us with emotion. So this is both emotional and willful, as, as is the case in 1 John 4, 8. God is love, agape. Now it is true that the New Testament most often speaks of God's love as being willful, not as many references to it being emotional, but what I want to caution you about is not assuming that God's love is only willful and thus is mechanical and is, in, is not in any way emotional. That would not be accurate. God's love is both emotional and willful. <clears throat> Third bullet point, the objects of God's love. God loves himself. That sounds a little bit strange because we know what the Bible has to say about you know, not loving yourself but denying yourself and dying to yourself. But God's love, because it's perfect and because he is perfect, God loves himself and other members of the Godhead. John 5.20, the Father loves the Son. So God loves the, the triune Godhead. Each member loves one another. Secondly, God loves his rational creatures, that is, people. And I believe, you, you may know that there's some debate on this because of some verses, and we don't have time tonight to try to unravel all of this, but, but I think there are numerous statements that God loves all unbelievers. I take John 3.16, God so loved the world, to refer to the world. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Of course it is true, let her be there, believers experience more of the benefits of God's love. Um, maybe here's a way to illustrate it. The sun shines, right? I mean, the sun is so powerful in its rays and in its heat, it shines. So if you, you know, if you're just outside on a sunny day, you're going to get shined on. Uh, the only way you don't experience the sun's rays is, is if you go in the shade. Well, we, we may draw some kind of parallel with that. God is love. He loves. It doesn't just say God loves. He is love. So therefore, that's who he is, what he is. So therefore, the only way you don't experience God's love is to put yourself in the shade. And that's just an analogy. In other words, to reject his love, to, to rebuff his invitations to eternal life. Uh, but God is love, and therefore, uh, he loves all people, all unbelievers, but only believers experience the benefits of his love. Uh, benevolence, kindness. This is another one. This is uh, the second one. So God is love, and now we're moving on to the second aspect of God's goodness, and that is benevolence or kindness. Once again, this is extended to both the just and the unjust. Theologians also uh, are, are often refer to this as common grace. Uh, Matthew 5.45, God sends the rain on the just and on the unjust, right? I mean, if you're in a community of farmers, and you've got a unjust, unrighteous farmer's field here, and then right next to it is a godly man, his field. You know, when it rains, it rains on both fields. And when the sun shines, it shines on both. So Psalm 145, 9 says, The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. So this is why it's called common grace, God's benevolence, his kindness. He is good. He is benevolent. He is kind. But of course, again, second bullet point, only true believers can fully appreciate this. This is why the psalmist said in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and soul and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And do not forget his benefits. 
don't forget them. Unbelievers just sort of presume upon them and just take them for granted. As believers, we should not. We should be very conscious, aware of God's goodness, His kindness, His benevolence, the good gifts that He gives us in life. Third aspect of the goodness of God is His mercy. Uh, a couple of the key verses, Ephesians 2, 4, which says, but God, you know, the, the Ephesians 2 begins talking about us being dead in trespasses and sins, walking according to the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air. But then verse 4 says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. So God is rich in mercy, that verse says. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. So God is a God of mercy. So what does this mean? Well, the explanation, this is goodness shown to those in misery and distress. It is pity in action, which relieves the affliction and suffering caused by sin. God could just never step in, never show any pity, never re relieve affliction, just say, hey, it's deserved because we're sinners, and that's true. Any distressful, difficult, hurtful thing that could happen to us, we deserve, but God is a God of mercy. So the exercise of God's mercy, well, please understand so that we don't cheapen His mercy. This is optional with God, as He was not bound to extend it. If you say God is obligated to extend mercy, now you have just created a contradiction because it's no longer mercy. It's something God is obligated to show, but He's not obligated to show but he purposed to do so in his plan. And Romans 9.15 says that very clearly. God says, I'll have mercy upon whom I'll have mercy. In other words, I'm not obligated to show mercy. The very fact that God does shows us again the immensity of his love, his goodness, etc. And of course, second bullet point there, man is saved according to mercy, Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And then thirdly, it is extended in accordance with God's justice since His mercy can't overrule His justice. That is, when it comes to the future judgment, God cannot say, well, I'm a God of mercy, and therefore, even though you never repented, even though you rejected my Son, Jesus Christ, I'll just have mercy on you and let you into heaven. That God cannot do that. His mercy can't overrule His justice. Then, the next aspect of God's goodness that we want to talk about is His grace. Uh, this is the bestowal of goodness to one who has no claim to it. It is unmerited goodness. Grace takes various forms, according to Scripture. Uh, one form, the ultimate form, maybe you would say, is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Titus 2.11 says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age. So the grace of God has appeared. Uh, Jesus Christ is the grace of God incarnate. But it also takes another form, letter B, a strength or endurance. You remember when Paul said, Oh, Lord, I have this, this thorn in my flesh. Maybe a better translation of that Greek word would be stake, not S-T-E-A-K, but S-T-A-K-E, a stake, a huge impaling stake. I have this stake in my flesh. Oh, Lord, won't you remove it? And you remember the Lord's response? No, I won't remove it, but I will increase grace, Paul. I'll grant you the strength to, to endure. I will grant you endurance. So that is another form of God's grace, endurance. And then what you might call, for lack of a better term, specialties. Uh, Hebrews 4.16 it says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find grace in our time of need. So whatever that happens to be, God knows. Uh, but uh, when we are in need to go to the Lord, who's the God of all grace, and God is a gracious God to provide what we really need. Now, what is the relationship of grace to mercy? Because there are almost synonyms. In fact, a lot of times we use them synonymously. And that's, that's okay, but there probably is some slight distinction, so, so let's delineate that. 
Uh, grace views man as guilty. Mercy views man as miserable. So grace gives man what he does not deserve because we're guilty. We don't deserve anything, but grace gives us what we do deserve. Mercy withholds what, what man does deserve. And what is that? Well, we deserve judgment. We deserve affliction. And mercy withholds what we do deserve. So again, very closely related, close uh, interaction of the two aspects of God's goodness, these two attributes, but maybe a slight distinction as delineated there. Now, when it comes to the exercise of grace or God showing grace, again, it's very important that we recognize that this is optional with God as he was not bound to show it. Again, if you start implying or you embrace in your mind this idea that God is obligated to give grace, now you've just destroyed grace. Now you've destroyed it at its root or in its, its, its basic meaning. Grace is something undeserved. God is not obligated to show it. Second bullet point, Old Testament saints guilty of deliberate or what was called high sin could plead for grace. And then thirdly, the supreme display of grace is our salvation. Two of the most famous verses in the Bible, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, by grace you have been saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This is the sup supreme display of grace, and that is salvation. Continuing the same thought, the exercise of grace, God's grace in salvation. Now think about it this way. God's grace in salvation is a denial of man's inherent goodness. In other words, if man were inherently good, we wouldn't need grace. But the fact that we all need grace to be saved is in essence saying we are not good. It's a denial of our inherent goodness. Second bullet point there, salvation grace is based on the death of Christ. In other words, the death of Christ you could almost see it this way, that the death of Christ sort of filled up the reservoir of God's grace, and which is why I say in that third bullet point, there is a proper treasury of merit in Christ. It is from the merit of Christ that God shows us grace and saves us. And then the fifth aspect of God's goodness is what you could call long-suffering, uh, God's patience. It's just translated uh, a number of different ways in the New Testament, depending on your, you know, your English translation. Uh, first bullet point: the New Testament term means to endure long before anger, and that is why one of the other English words that sometimes occurs in our translations is forbearance. That is to bear long, to forbear. So long suffering also brings that out. Long suffering, that is God suffers long before anger. All of these words in English come from the, the Greek term that means to endure long before anger. So what does this mean? Well this means God bears with sinners a long time before displaying anger. God does. I mean I don't know how you feel about this but there are times and this is I say this to my shame but there are times when I look at this world, I look at our society and I think, God, why don't you just smite it? You know, just judge and look at the awful stuff, you know, that 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 goes on in our society. I saw just what two nights ago a a, a picture from a march, a, a, a march that was going on of a, a couple women holding a sign that, of all things, read, "If Mary had had an abortion, we wouldn't be in this mess." And when I see something like that, it just, I think, God, why don't you just send a lightning bolt from heaven? I mean, how blasphemous is that to talk about Mary aborting Jesus? I mean, I, I can think of a few things more blasphemous. And so, you know, in, in our own uh, sinfulness, we, we think we know better than God, and we aren't nearly as patient, nearly as long-suffering. God bears with sinners a long time before displaying anger. Third bullet point, the postponement of deserved judgment or righteous anger. This is what patience, God's patience is. It's the postponement. God could, he, he'd be totally righteous if he brought it now, if he brought judgment now. But 
He postpones what is deserved. He postpones righteous anger. And that is because he is patient, long-suffering, forbearing. And in fact, in the days of Noah, think about how long God waited after he had said he's going to send a flood. Noah builds an ark for you know, 120 years. I mean, it's amazing that, that it would take that long. And then even today, 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. He's long-suffering, Peter says. That's why he waits so long and why, in a sense, you could say that's why this world is still going on. God is giving opportunity for people to repent. And he is incredibly, amazingly patient, long-suffering. All right, some points of application then on all of this. Not just what we've covered tonight, the attributes of God, moral, non-moral, but even going back to last week, the essence of God. A first bullet point there, the essence and attributes of God should be what we focus on when we praise the Lord. Thanks would be directed toward his gifts. Now this is not a hard and fast rule by any means, but just trying to divide it up in our minds to get more clarity or a clearer understanding. When we think about who God is, His essence, His attributes, it prompts praise. And when we think about what God has done, His gifts toward us, it prompts thanksgiving so that we thank the Lord. But again, that's, that's not necessarily a, or automatically a biblical distinction, just more of a logical distinction. Bullet point number two, the more correct and full is our knowledge of God, the more correct and full will be our thinking and acting. Remember the statement I made last week? Boy, and I stand by it. Right thinking begins by thinking right about what God is like. If you have skewed views of God in your mind, if you have an inaccurate view of God in your mind, I don't mean incomplete because all of us have incomplete an incomplete view of God. There's no way we could have a totally complete view of God. He's, he's beyond us. But if you have skewed views of God, warped views of God, it will impact you. And it will come out in your life and in my life. So the more correct and full is our knowledge of God, the more correct and full will be our thinking and acting. I've seen this countless times through the years as a pastor working with people. They come in for counseling and they're having all sorts of struggles, and many times at the root is a skewed view of God, and the impact of that, the sort of the domino effect, is often very sad and tragic. So third bullet point, we should make knowing more about the person of God one of our primary goals in life. Remember what Jesus said in John 17, 3, This is life eternal, that they may know you. The Greek word gnosko experiential know you, and it's a present tense, so ongoing. Jesus prays to the Father, this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So Jesus was saying, this is the life, knowing God, experientially knowing God, ongoing, getting to know God more and more and more. We should make knowing more about God one of our primary goals in life. All right, with that, we turn to the last major section of our course here on theology proper or on the person of God, and that is the unity and trinity of God. The unity and trinity of God. Let's begin with some definitions. First of all, when it comes to the unity of God, what we're saying is there is but one God whose nature is undivided and indivisible. There's only one God. There aren't three gods, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No, there's one God. There is not a multiplicity of gods like all of Israel's neighbors believed in throughout their existence. And this is why God kept driving home and driving home the point. There's only one God, one true God. So let's expand on this, the explanation of unity. Uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 emphasizes uniqueness and unity. Uh, you know that verse probably. It is considered by most theologians the central verse of the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That is saying the Lord is unique. There's only one true God, not many, and this God is one. This God is a unity. Now, of course, God did not spell out a lot, a lot about his triunity in the Old Testament, but 
you can see when he makes an emphasis on unity, it's because of what he will later reveal about his triunity so that no one would mistakenly think, oh, uh, there are three uh, persons or three gods or these three persons are completely out on their own. No, God is unique and God is unity. Other verses would be James 2.19, you believe God is one, good for you, and then of course the demons also believe and tremble. John 10.30, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. And by the way, he did not use the masculine term for one, because then he would have been saying, I and my Father are the same person, which is not true. The Father and the Son are not the same person. He used the neuter form there, I and my Father are one, so you could almost translate it, I and my Father are one in essence. They are one in essence. They're, that again, emphasizing unity. Third bullet point, God does not consist of parts, nor can he be divided into parts. God is one. In this one, there are three persons, and these persons are all persons. It's not like they're partly persons and they sort of therefore share some you know, you, you, you're, you're trying to compose God of parts, you divide them into parts, put it together, and then you have God. No, God is not a unit, but a unity. However, God is not like a rock, a unity like a, the ingredients in a rock, but he has, but has internal distinctions of personness. Now, maybe already at this point you're starting to have your head spin, and that's understandable. As one old Quaker put it, listen, he said, if you ignore the doctrine of the Trinity, you will lose your soul. If you try to fully understand it, you'll lose your mind. And that's a good uh, caution for us. We're, we're not going to be able to fully probe this, but we want to at least do the best we can. So, the triunity of God. Here's a definition. There are three eternal persons in one divine nature known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Very important definition. Three eternal persons, not three gods, three eternal persons in one divine nature. Each of these three persons has the exact same nature, known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's a, a definition of the triunity of God. And by the way, you maybe noticed that I don't use the term Trinity, I don't think it's a bad term, but Trinity only emphasizes threeness, but as we're seeing here and as, we're, as we see in Scripture, God not only emphasizes His threeness, He emphasizes His oneness, uh, and He emphasizes His oneness throughout the Old Testament almost exclusively, and then He adds additional revelation on His threeness, and so that is why I prefer the term the tri-unity of God. It, it is a term that encompasses both his threeness and his oneness. So again, look at that definition. There are three eternal persons in one divine nature known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, some background considerations. Uh, first of all, first bullet point. Uh, this doctrine, the doctrine of the triunity of God, is known only through the special revelation of Scripture, not through experience or natural theology. In other words, what, what I'm saying there is this. Uh, there is no way we could know this truth if God had not chosen to reveal it. It's the only way. It is too complex. You can't, in, you know, in general revelation and God's creation, there's no way in creation you can come up with this idea that there are three eternal persons in one divine nature, you know, equal in substance, distinct in subsistence, known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You can't come up with that through uh, your experience, through natural theology, through general revelation. God had to reveal it. Second bullet point, this doctrine is known inductively from Scripture because it is not specifically stated anywhere. In other words, you don't have any verse in the Bible that says what I was just saying a moment ago by way of definition, that there are three eternal persons in one divine nature, distinct in, uh, equal in substance, distinct in subsistence, known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You don't have a verse that says that. So, this truth is known through revealed facts rather than a stated formula. It is revealed partly 
as persons of the Godhead are said to act in relation to creation and man. In other words, when you have descriptions of Jesus, the God the Son acting, or God the Holy Spirit, or God the Father, that is how, when you take all the information together, you, you do an inductive study, and you take all the data, all the facts, and then you begin to piece together, this is what the Bible teaches about God, that he is a triunity. So, the emphasis and intimations of the Old Testament, I've already sort of touched on this, the unity and fatherhood of God are emphasized in the Old Testament. His triunity is not, now there are hints, but the reason, I think we, we, we can safely assume or safely state that the reason why God did not reveal his threeness in the Old Testament is because his people were living in the midst of polytheistic societies. There were so many gods, the God of rain, the God of sun, the God of fertility, the God of the crops. And so had God revealed to his people Israel that he was three, it is almost certain that they would have concluded there are three gods. They would say, oh, there aren't multiple gods like all the pagans around us believe, you know, dozens of gods or hundreds of gods. There are three. No, there aren't three. There aren't three gods. There is one God, and that's why that, as I said, most Hebrew scholars believe that the number one theological emphasis of the Old Testament, of Hebrew Scripture, is that there is one true God, Yahweh, the God of Israel is the one true God. And again, now, uh, there are hints that this one true God consists of three persons, but it is certainly not spelled out. So, bullet point number two, how far the Old Testament takes us on the doctrine of the Trinity, or the triunity of God. How far does it take us? Well, uh, number one, there is intimation of plurality in the Godhead. Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our, plural, own image. Genesis 11.7, about the Tower of Babel, let us go down. Let us, plural, go down. Uh, even as I mentioned last week, the very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God, Elohim, that's a plural noun, Bereshit bara Elohim, third word of the Hebrew Bible, is a plural noun referring to God. In the beginning, God. Plural. So there are clearly intimations of plurality in the Godhead. And secondly, there is some indication. In other words, when you once you have the New Testament teaching and you understand that there is a triunity or trinity, then you can go back in the Old Testament and say, oh, there it is, but it would be tough to see if you didn't already have some clarity. Uh, the doctrine is, is, is definitely more fully revealed in the New Testament. And that is because, of course, the New Testament records the time the Son became incarnate, so God the Son became a man. And the New Testament records the Spirit's coming to permanently indwell Christians. So now we see two other distinct persons in the Godhead in addition to the Father. So let's see if we can come up with a limited explanation, and it's only limited. First of all, there is no subordination or inferiority of essential being within the Godhead. In other words, number one, full undiminished deity belongs equally to each member. The Father is not more God than the Son. The Son is not more God than the Spirit. The Father is not more God than the Spirit. However you want to say it. The Spirit is not more God than the Son. Full, undiminished deity belongs equally to each member. They are equal in substance. Uh, number two, for example, and I just said this, the Son is not less powerful than the Father or the Spirit. Number three, the Spirit is not more omnipresent or immense than the Father. Uh, he's not that because Psalm 139 says, Where can I go from your Spirit? That the Spirit is more omnipresent than the Father. No, full Undiminished deity belongs equally to each member. Each is fully God. However, a logical subordin there is a logical subordin subordination in rank and relationship. In other words, the Son is begotten of the Father. This is called in theology 
the generation of the sun. For example, Psalm 2.7, the decree, uh, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, there, was ne there never was a time when the son was brought into existence. That's not what it means. Micah 5.2 refers to him as eternal. Uh, Psalm 2.7 is a revelation of the relationships within the Godhead in man's terms. So what does it mean that the son is begotten of the father or the generation of the son? It's of all areas of theology, it may be the most difficult to explain or even the most difficult to try to wrap your mind around. The scripture teaches it. It doesn't mean that there is an inferiority in person, but there is this logical subordination in rank and relationship. That's not only between the Son and the Father, but the second bullet point, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And in theology, this is called the procession of the Holy Spirit. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. So that is this logical subordination. The Father sends the Spirit. Well, if He sends Him, then again, that's a logical subordination that the Spirit does what the Father says. Is it because the Spirit is less God? No. Uh, Jesus, throughout the Gospel of John, says, I obey the Father, I do the will of the Father. Is it because Jesus is less deity than the Father? No. This is a logical subordination in rank. It is a subordination of relationship where the Son submits to the Father, the Spirit submits to the Father and Son. So when it comes to the Spirit, look at number one there. This was not eternal, but involved a ministry performed in time when the Father and the Son sent the Spirit to come to this earth on the day of Pentecost, uh, etc. So this was not, not an, eternal, um, an eternal subordination, but involved a ministry performed in time. Uh, number two, however, the Spirit is called the Spirit of God. He's called the Spirit of Christ because He proceeds from the Father. He proceeds from the Son. He's not less than the Father nor less than the Son, but He takes on a logical or relational subordination to the Father and the Son. And even as I say all this, I recognize my own inadequacy to try to be able to grasp this and explain it any better than that. So, here's a limited explanation. All three members are separate and distinct persons. All three are distinct persons. We're not talking about modalism. Modalism is a doctrine that basically says this. There is only one God, which is true, and there are this one God plays three different roles, which is not true. So, in other words, modalism says that there's one God who plays three roles. So in the Old Testament, he played the role of the Father, and then he sort of changed clothes, if you will, and he came to the earth and he played the role of the Son, and then he ascended back into heaven, he changed clothes once again, and then he played the role of the Spirit. No, that is completely unbiblical. Yes, there's one God, but no, this one God doesn't play there's, there's no, it's, it's not true that there's just one person playing three different roles. Three, all three members are separate and distinct persons. For example, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, in the Great Commission, we are told, go baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One name, three persons. Three distinct persons. In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, in Paul's benediction, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And notice that the order doesn't matter. We usually think Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But there, in that benediction, it's Son, Father, Spirit. Because the order doesn't matter. They are all equal. You can list them in any order. The reason we usually go Father, Son, Spirit is because of what we were talking about a moment ago, this relational subordination. But it's not a subordination in essence. They are equal in essence. Uh, limited explanation continued. Uh, there are certain works which distinguish the three members. Now all members participate in all divine works jointly, at least volitionally or willfully. In other words, creation. Who created? The Father did. The Son did. The Spirit was involved in creation. We see that in the early verses of Genesis. The Spirit hovering over the deep, 
So all three members were involved. Who was involved in redemption? Well, all three members. The Father sent the Son. The Son uh, offered Himself as a sacrifice. The Spirit was involved in redemption. The Spirit is the one who draws us to Christ. So all members participate in all divine works jointly, at least volitionally or willfully. The Bible does attribute some works more to one than the other. Uh, the Father created. Now we know John 1 3 says all things were created by the Son, and Colossians 1 says the same thing, but most passages on creation talk about the Father creating. The Son provides redemption because He's the one who died. He said in Luke 17, the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. So the Son provides redemption and it carries out redemption, but Jesus also said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. We also know that the Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So again, Father, Son, and Spirit are all involved in redemption, but primarily when redemption is discussed and described, the Son is central. The Spirit sanctifies, the work of the Spirit to sanctify us, to draw us. Uh, the Spirit also is the one who gave us the Word of God. It's called the sword of the Spirit. He guided human authors to give us the Word. Now, the Father was behind the Word and the Son, but primarily that is attributed to the Spirit. So that's what I mean by this statement. The Bible attributes some works more to one than the other, though all three were clearly involved in all divine works. All right, continuing a limited explanation, uh, there are no proper analogies or illustrations of the Trinity or triunity of God. We all wish there were. We all long for one because this is so much uh, over our, our heads. But really, there are no proper analogies. In some, the idea of personality is lacking. For example, maybe you've heard someone try to illustrate the triunity of God by saying, well, it's like H2O. It can have the form of ice, water, or steam. Yes, that's true. But ice, water, and steam don't have any personality. You, you do have the same substance in three different forms or three distinct entities, if you will, but there's no personality. Uh, some say, well, the triunity of God is like an egg. It's the shell, the yolk, and the white. Yeah, but again, personality is lacking. Some say, well, it's like the sun. The sun, heat, and light, they're all interrelated. They're three distinct things, but, but sun, heat, and light all go together. Well, that's, again, that's true, but no personality in that illustration. In other illustrations, unity of substance is lacking. So, for example, some people say, well, it's sort of like triplets. Well, not really, because triplets are three distinct persons. But triplets aren't equal in substance. They are, uh, they are not equal. They're not exactly all the same in holiness and love. And, you know, triplets can be very different, different personalities and even different spiritual condition and all of that. So... In that illustration, unity of substance is lacking. They are not identical. So what are the indications of the Old Testament? Well, there is a person called Lord God or Father who is God. There is a person called the Spirit of God or Holy Spirit, Genesis 1, Psalm 51, who is God. The person who is called the Angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ who is God. If you just look at those four lines of evidence, he's distinguished from God. But he's referred to as God. He does not appear in the New Testament where God is revealed in Christ. Neither the Father nor the Spirit are ever seen. The Son is so. The angel of Yahweh. Not an angel. Definite article the. The angel of, in all caps, the angel of Yahweh is the pre-incarnate Christ. So you do have three distinct persons in the Old Testament. But again, as I said, if you didn't have the New Testament to give you more information, you probably wouldn't recognize it. So we close with this slide, and that is, what is the teaching of the New Testament? Well, the key verses, Matthew 3, where Jesus was baptized, the Son is baptized, the Father speaks from heaven, the Spirit descends like a dove. We've already talked about Matthew 28, 19, one name, three persons, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Those are key verses. So the Father is recognized as God. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, For us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things and we for him. The Father is recognized as God. The Son is recognized as God. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. John 20, 28, Thomas said, My Lord and my God, when he looked into the face of Jesus, 
The Father is recognized as God. The Son is recognized as God. John 10.30, I and my Father are one. And the Spirit is recognized as God. In Acts 5, Peter says um, to Ananias, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And in the very next verse, you've lied to God. So that tells us the Holy Spirit is God. When you lie to the Holy Spirit, you're lying to God because the Holy Spirit is God. So the New Testament explicitly tells us not in these exact words, but there are three eternal persons in one divine nature, equal in substance, distinct in subsistence, known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is our great God. Thank you for your time.